Good evening, everybody. How you doing? It's Pablo Frescobar here. And you know, I was uh, I was watching one of SKC's uh, recent videos. Um, and if you give me just a second, I can tell you what it was. Um, it was the community case study, a bad argument, bad argumentation. And, you know, also the follow up to love your animals, love your animals. Well, you know, SKC is going into a debate tonight. He's 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 having a debate with a member of the community. And you know, SKC doesn't believe in 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 uh, he doesn't like uh elitism. But Pablo believes in elitism because, and, and, and here's why, here's why. Because in nature, things that are untamed cannot survive, they do not thrive in a domesticated state. When they are untamed. And I wanted to share a couple of stories with you about when some particular animals are, are, are untamed and then you try to bring them into captivity to live within certain boundaries. They don't survive well. They don't thrive. Or if they do thrive, they present a hazard to all of those around them. So in the first case, we're going to take a look at the great white shark and how, how the great white shark cannot be tamed. It cannot be bought into captivity. Let's take a look at that. There are some shark species that seem to do okay in aquariums. You'll see a lot of nurse sharks, zebra sharks, some reef sharks, and sand tiger sharks, but not the great white. For, For decades, decades, aquariums, aquariums have tried to contain the world's largest predatory fish. Institutions like Marineland, SeaWorld, and the Steinart Aquarium repeatedly took in white sharks during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, at times drawing huge crowds. But they never lasted long. Some needed help swimming. None of them would eat. The longest one lasted was just 16 days. A 1984 report by the Steinart Aquarium put it this way. In most cases, it could be said that all of these captive sharks were merely in the process of dying, with some taking longer than others. They had constructed an elaborate transport tank with a harness and IV fluids, but still couldn't keep the sharks alive. It wasn't until 2004 that the Monterey Bay Aquarium proved that it was possible to keep white sharks for at least six months. It took a massive effort and no one's done it since. Our approach was one of sort of a systematic logical sequence of things leading up to our success and it started with designing the tank. The Monterey Bay Aquarium had a million gallon egg shaped tank, 35 feet deep, designed for open ocean animals like tuna and sharks. So you need a big tank. You also need a small shark. Adult great whites reach 15 feet on average. The Monterey Bay Aquarium nabbed one in 2004 that was four feet, four inches, less than a year old. That made it easier to move and easier to keep. When they're young, they feed on fish. And as they get older, they transition to feeding more on mammals. And so we were targeting the age bracket where we were more able to feed their, their natural diet. And once they collected the shark, they didn't take it straight to the aquarium. Instead, the Monterey Bay team set up a four million gallon pen right there in the ocean. Now, I want you to note that the great white, when they start out as, you know, young baby, little great whites, they'll feed on, on fish. They'll, they'll eat fish. Right. 
But as they age and grow, they need more protein. They need more sustenance. And they will then begin to prey on the other animals, seals, sea lions, walrus, whatever. You understand? Marine mammals. Now, now they need larger prey. Right? So, you know, when something that grows at the rate and consumes as much as a great white it's insatiable you can't provide it enough food and it would be distasteful to feed it other mammals i mean peter would go crazy if you tried to you know start clubbing seals and feeding them to great whites in the aquarium. You can't do that. But it's interesting that the members of the community, when allowed to roam free, their insatiable appetites increase as well. Their insatiable appetites increase. You can't provide them with enough hose. You can't provide them with enough real niggas. It's never enough. It ain't enough weave in the, in the hair supply store for them. They're standing outside in line waiting. It's not enough. And so they cannot be they cannot be held captive. Now I realize SKC is going on the debate with uh, on, on T over on Teapot channel tonight. But I implore him. You can't you can't tame the wild. They're not meant to be, they're not meant to be held, held down, held back, restrained in any way. It's not going to work. No amount of enlightenment will change their, uh, how they live. This is, it's nature. Let's continue. That way they can monitor the shark and see if it would feed before they moved it into a transport tank to travel from Southern California, where the sharks were born, up to the aquarium. Sharks, like all fish, need to have water continually passing through their gills in order to get oxygen. Most species can open and close their mouths to pump water through, but white sharks and a couple dozen other species don't do that. To breathe, they have to move forward through the water with their mouths open. That's why white sharks start to weaken as soon as they're caught in a net. And that's why they needed a custom-built transport tank for mobile life support. Everything from oxygen sensors and video cameras and lighting and filtration systems uh, that were needed for the what turned out to roughly be 9 to 11 hour transport time. Aquarium attendants jumped 30% while the shark was on display. After six and a half months, they decided to release it because it had killed two other sharks. Over the next six years, the aquarium displayed five more baby white sharks. Some they paid fishermen to hand over, some they caught themselves. Their stays ranged from just 11 days up to five months. The Monterey Bay Aquarium had succeeded in doing what no one else could, but it did take a toll on the sharks. They developed visible sores from bumping into the sides of the tank. Uh, we actually snuck in with photographers and, and took pictures you know, of the sharks as, as they were beginning to attrit and fail due to constant scraping against the wall, basically. Remember, remember the, the, the Blackfish documentary that I talked about? 
No, I I I, I, th I think it's uh, one of those uh, somebody from the community. Is it not? I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I know lately he was uh, on on his uh, community case study. He was going back and forth with some members of the community, the pro blacks. Yeah. So, as you can see, what is wild, it, 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 if you put it in captivity, it will not only kill others, but injure themselves as well. They will injure themselves as well. So we can't. You know, resistance is futile to try to tame, restrain, enlighten. No. The beast of the field is the beast of the field. Now, SKC won't go as far as I will. He, he resists saying that. Well, he didn't say they were animals. Well, listen. If it can't be restrained, if it cannot be tamed, if it cannot live within the boundaries of polite society, then what is it? You tell me. It's untamed. It's untamed, John. As, as we viewed it, it was a, a base of flowers that would be kept for the visitors. Historically, aquariums kept sharks that lived near the seabed or near reefs. That makes sense. It's easier to recreate those habitats in a tank. But in recent decades, aquariums have wanted to bring in bigger, more pelagic sharks, those that spend time roaming the open ocean. They've even been able to exhibit the largest shark in the world, the whale shark, if they have a big enough tank. But pelagic sharks are used to being able to swim long distances without obstructions, changing directions only as they please. So the faster moving sharks like the white shark, mako shark, and blue shark, they have trouble with walls when they're put in a tank. That's what was happening with the Monterey Bay Aquarium's sixth white shark. In Notice that they have trouble with boundaries. They have trouble with boundaries. They, 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 they're not used to that. And so when presented with boundaries time and time and time after again, they will bump up against the boundaries until they eventually hurt themselves. The school to prison pipeline, uh, anyone. When presented with boundaries, they will bump up against it until they injure themselves. Does this sound familiar? Let us continue. In 2011, they decided to release it after 55 days and its tracking tag revealed that the shark died shortly after being released. They're not sure why. But since then, they haven't tried to bring in another great white shark. It's a very, very, very resource intensive program. And we felt like we had accomplished our goal of introducing the general public to a live white shark. It took a huge, carefully planned system to keep a white shark alive. And even then, the sharks didn't quite fit there. We can't seem to stop trying though. Earlier this year, an 11 and a half foot great white shark was taken to an aquarium in Okinawa, Japan, after getting caught in a fisherman's net. It was the only adult white shark ever to be put on display. And within three days, it was dead. So again, boundaries, captivity, it's not working. It, 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 it won't work for the untamed. They tried and they realized, you know what? This is a bad idea. We, 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 we tried to domesticate 
this particular animal and it's 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 just not working. It's not working. So I mean, where where will where should we go but to nature to see the plight of the community? Bumping up against shit, killing shit, eating up shit. I mean, you've seen the obesity rates, right? You tell me. And they're they're killing everything in the tank, including themselves. What more evidence do you need? Let's continue. I wanted to show you a great resource online called the Biodiversity Heritage Library. It's the product of a couple dozen museums and libraries all agreeing to scan millions of pages from books related to biodiversity. They got a bunch of great albums on Flickr, including one that's all about sharks. Some of these go back to the 16th and 17th centuries, back when naturalists used to call sharks sea dogs. Which is funny because, as we now know, sharks were roaming the oceans for about 300 million years before the first mammals showed up. So, I mean, there we have it. I mean, what, what could possibly be gained from debating with a great white? Now, I don't know who he's debating tonight. Uh, are, is this person there debating? Are they part of the community or, or no? Right? And what is the topic? I'm not sure. Because, you know, I don't, I don't. Oh, and I have another. Uh. another video to share D Durrells is is D Durrell like a pro black what what was what's D what's D Durrell all about is he a pro black one of the community members I mean y'all tell me I I don't know I, you know I don't A day to some versus. I mean, I'm I'm trying to learn. Trying to learn. Here. D. Darrell is a pro black who called SYSBM pedos. Oh yes, okay, yeah, exactly. Like I said, this you can't tame the wild. Hold on a second. You cannot tame the wild. And I'm about to queue up. I'm about to queue up another video that shows us how things are with things that are wild. Did you ever see the story about the tiger in Harlem? Where the guy had the tiger in the apartment building, in, in, in the projects, in the housing projects in Harlem. Well, we're about to watch that. Let's go. Being pranked, emergency service unit cop Martin Duffy thought the old timer was hazing him when he reported to work and was told his mission for the afternoon. But it was no joke. Soon Officer Duffy found himself climbing out of a window on the seventh floor and rappelling down the side of a 21-story Harlem apartment building. 
At the fifth floor, he dangled, peering into an apartment window, then took aim and fired a tranquilizer dart gun. The dart hit the 400-pound tiger in the rump. Enraged, the massive cat roared, showing off long, wicked-looking canines, and then charged toward the window. From the time he was little, Antoine Yates adored animals. He was always bringing home stray puppies or injured birds. His mother Martha indulged his love, allowing her son to keep a variety of pets throughout his childhood. As Antoine got older, his interests turned to more indulged his love, allowing her son to keep a variety of pets. When he was little, Antoine Yates. Antoine Yates did not live in a suburban single family home with green grass trees. He lived in a public housing project in Harlem. He lived in public housing in Harlem. Let's continue. adored animals. He was always bringing home stray puppies or injured birds. His mother Martha indulged his love, allowing her son to keep a variety of pets throughout his childhood. As Antoine got older, his interests turned to more exotic animals. The peace he found in taking care of animals was a refuge against the dangerous crime-infested Harlem neighborhood where he grew up in the early 1980s. While his brother Aaron took to the streets, Antoine was inside with his pets. Over time, he had boa constrictors and several other reptiles, capuchin and squirrel monkeys. In the spring of 2000, the Yates family, which included a rotating group of foster kids, was living in a five-bedroom apartment in the Drew Hamilton houses, a huge dismal housing project built in the 1960s. Antoine, now in his early 30s, concocted a plan with his mother and sister to open a zoo. He already owned two pythons and a caiman. Despite only being a part-time taxi driver, Antoine was able to save up thousands of dollars and falsify papers to prove he had a zoo in order to purchase a lion club from the Bearcat Hollow Animal Park in Racine, Minnesota. Later, Antoine also purchased Ming, an eight-week-old Siberian Bengal hybrid tiger cub from the same breeders. In addition to his other pets, eventually Antoine ended up with two lions and two tiger cubs. Not long after, his mom and sister backed out of the zoo project and Antoine was forced to give up his new pets. Antoine rehomed the pythons, lion cubs, and one of the tigers, but kept Al, the caiman, and Ming, the tiger cub, whom he especially loved. Over the next three years, Antoine raised Ming in the Yate family's fifth floor apartment. He fed him bottles around the clock. Ming quickly graduated to pureed meat and then meat chunks. Martha gradually became unhappy with the living situation. Fearing for her and her children's safety, she and two foster children moved to Philadelphia, relinquishing apartment E5 to her son. Antoine built Ming a sand pit complete with balls. Al the Kaiman, who lived in another bedroom, had a custom fiberglass tank. Sometimes Antoine would freeze a pan of liver and give Ming a giant meat popsicle. By the time Ming was three in 2003, he'd weighed over 400 pounds. Antoine was feeding him about 20 pounds of raw chicken a day. The tiger was a semi-open secret. Some of Antoine's friends and neighbors were aware of the big cat. Across the way, there was a senior citizen center as part of the apartment complex. Ming used to stand on his hind legs and look out the window. Aaron joked with his brother about the workers at the retirement home, thinking that the old people were senile when they claimed to have seen a tiger looking out of an apartment window. On and off, Antoine had roommates who were at first scared but became accustomed to the tiger. Antoine went through bouts of depression where he was a recluse. He would mainly meditate and hang out with Ming. One day, Antoine found a small black kitten. As always, he took the stray home, naming it Shadow. He kept Shadow in a bedroom away from the tiger. Unfortunately, Shadow got out. Territorial Ming went for the kitten. Antoine tried to intervene and protect it. Aaron had a premonition that something was wrong and rushed over to the apartment to find his brother Antoine in shock. Ming had severely bitten Antoine's arm and leg. Aaron called 911, but there was no way they wanted the paramedics coming to the apartment and discovering Ming. Aaron helped his brother down to the lobby, where they were met by police. Antoine was transported to the Harlem Hospital Center, where he claimed that he'd been attacked by a bulldog. However, the doctors were suspicious. The bites looked like they came from an animal with a much larger jaw. Meanwhile, the So as you can see, that that is wild. will either harm itself 
and or both harm others. You can't tame that, which is wild. You can't reason with it. You can't. It will revert back no matter how kind you treat it. No matter how much love and care you provide. It will lash out. It will lash out at the most inopportune time. Police received two anonymous tips in the next few days following the attack. One said there was a wild animal somewhere in the city. The second call directed them to the exact address. That evening, a policeman came knocking on the door of apartment E5 for a welfare check. No one was home, but the officer heard loud growling noises coming from the apartment. Wisely, he decided to not go in. The officer talked to a neighbor who complained of large amounts of urine and a strong smell coming through the ceiling. Officers from Taru, the Technical Assistance Response Unit, drilled a hole through the neighbor's wall to get a visual of what was inside the apartment. They saw a mattress that had been shredded as if it were made of paper, claw marks scratched down the wall from ceiling to floor, and then Ming wandered into view. 400 pounds of rippling muscled cat, over 9 feet tall when he stood on his high. Hind legs. The massive tiger was even shocking to jaded police, who thought they had seen it all. The tiger was left alone for the night. The apartment cordoned off while the police formulated a plan. They didn't want to have to kill the tiger, yet they had to safely remove the big cat from the apartment while keeping the public protected. They called animal experts, including Dr. Robert A. Cook, the head veterinarian at the Bronx Zoo. Now, they didn't want to have to kill the tiger. They really didn't. So they thought they'd bring a tranquilizer dog. Sounds reasonable. Tasers, mace, billy clubs, all that. Sometimes you have to, you know, use what's available. Let's continue. I mean, this should sound familiar. This should sound familiar to those who live in the community. Let them live. There you go. Zoo for help. The next day, from the apartment below on the fourth floor, the police raised a pole-mounted camera out of the window to keep track of Ming. Meanwhile, on the seventh floor, the police laid out a strategy. Dr. Cook prepared tranquilizer darts for the chosen marksman, Officer Duffy, and gave him advice. Around 4.30 p.m., police sniper Duffy, armed both with a tranquilizer dart gun and a rifle with live ammunition, upsailed down to the fifth floor. Meanwhile, the word had gotten out about the tiger. The media, along with a curious crowd of citizens gathered below to watch. Dangling in a rope sling, Officer Duffy peered into the bedroom window of apartment E5. He could clearly see Ming peacefully chilling on the bedroom floor. The tiger looked back at the policeman and then turned slightly, giving Duffy a good view of his hindquarters. Duffy held the tranquilizer gun up to the window, making sure that the barrel wasn't blocked by the child's safety slings. Scarcely breathing, he pulled the trigger. The dart landed true hitting Ming in the butt. The tiger jumped up and went berserk. He roared and charged the window. The building shook as the massive cat smashed into the window, cracking it. As the tiger headbutted the window again, Duffy worried that the glass would give way. If the big cat survived the fall, they'd have an angry, injured tiger on a crowded public street. Duffy took aim and shot again. The second dart shot caused Ming to retreat. He laid down in a nest of plastic trash bags. About 12 minutes later, the tiger tried to get up but staggered feeling the effects of the sedation. After waiting another five minutes, guarded by a group of emergency service unit officers, Dr. Cook and another zoo staffer cautiously entered the apartment. Ming lay in a corner. The zoo staff slipped a restraint pole around Ming's head and gave him a little more sedative by injection to make sure he was sedated enough to transport. Ming was then lifted onto a gurney. A fire department oxygen mask was clamped to his face. The gurney was carefully wheeled down the hall and onto the elevator. Once they were on the street, officers had to force the crowd back as a half dozen men struggled to hoist Ming into the back of an animal care and control box truck. The police also removed Al the Kaiman, who was nearly five feet long, a rabbit, and several other.
for exotic and domestic pets from the apartment. The ants one had a second tiger, some bear cubs, two Rottweilers, more rabbits, and a tarantula. Ming was so, as you can see, things that are untamed, you know, eventually harm those around them. So tonight, SKC will be repelling into the apartment. He will be repelling into the apartment with the tranquilizer dart. <laughs> Good luck, SKC. Good luck. Because as I showed before in, in my example with the great white shark, things that are untamed cannot be restrained. They'll bump up against the tank and injure themselves. They'll kill other animals in the, in, in the uh, habitat. They'll tear up the mattress, pee on the floor. I mean, it's a tiger. It's a 400-pound tiger in the apartment, SKC. It's a 400-pound tiger in the apartment. What time is your is your debate? Is it 8 o'clock? Is it like now? Because if not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this. I'm going to end this so we can go on over and see if what is wild can be tamed. I don't believe so. But SKC is going to repel. It's 8 o'clock. Okay. So let's go on over and see if SKC can repel through the window <laughs> with the tranquilizer dart. And pull out the 400-pound tiger. I don't think he can. Well, maybe he can. I think he can. I think he can. This is Pablo Frescobar signing off. Have a good night. Let's go on over to Teapots and uh, watch this debate, shall we? What is wild or untamed will remain untamed. Thank you, SKC. See you tonight in a few minutes. Go on over and get started.